So, welcome to the next lecture in this series on structural geology and tectonics. Today's lecture is about faults. Faults are very important structures in the Earth crust. They are uh, nicely represented in the logo of our institute. Faults you have probably all seen or heard about in your uh, studies until now. And very, very simply, a fault can be a layer in the Earth which has been offset. And between these two offset layers, you have the fault plane. Today I'm going to show you that faults, in fact, are very, very complicated structures. They uh, are complicated in geometry. They are complicated in mechanics. And also, they have a major control on how fluids flow in the Earth. And I will go through all these aspects uh, one by one. But just to set the scene, I'm going to show you a movie of a sandbox model, which was done in our institute here, um, to give you a feeling of the processes in fault zones. Okay. So this movie is going to loop, so it will come back again. This experiment is about this big. It is made out of chips and powder and uh, some coloring. And we, we move down this block here and form a graben structure. Okay? In the beginning, there are no faults. And quite spontaneously, in this package of uh, gypsum powder, the deformation localizes. It becomes sharply heterogeneous. And sometimes there are openings which form. And this is, of course, a normal fault, an option bone. This side is actually going down. And I will show you this movie at the end of the lecture again, and then probably you will understand much more about it than now. So let me just stop this movie and go back to the PowerPoint presentation. So the lecture is about faults. The classification of faults, very, very simply, is that there are faults with different uh, way of motion or sense of motion. There are the normal faults. There are the reverse faults, the faults which move up. And there are the strike-slip faults, which move in a horizontal direction. Okay, this is the normal fault. This is the reverse fault. These are the strike-slip faults. And these can move in two different directions. We will talk about that later in the, uh, the strike-slip fault lecture. And then there are oblique faults, the more complex ones. These are faults which, which don't just move down or up, but obliquely in this direction. And then there are even some more complicated faults in which the blocks actually rotate. And all these things can be combined, so there can be a rotational normal fault, there can be a rotational reverse fault, or strike-slip faults can also do like this. Examples of that are all around us in this area of Europe. Um, in this block, which maybe you have seen uh, before, um, you, have seen, you, you can see the subsurface of the Aachen area. Here is Aachen, here is Köln. And on this side, you have the Varisken Trust Belt, and the faults are mainly reverse faults. And here, you have the Niederrheinische Bucht, the lower Rhine embayment, and the faults are normal faults. These are the old ones. These are much younger. Um, these are quite flat-lying, and these are quite steep, and also seismically active. You have probably all felt or heard about the earthquakes which are active in this area at the moment. Okay. So this brings us to the, to the sound which faults make when they move. Some faults are really seismic. 
This area, this picture you have seen before, the area near San Francisco, the faults are locked, and every 100 years, or maybe every 15 years, you get earthquakes, and that really makes a sound in the earth. There are waves going through the earth. Other faults slip much more continuously. This is a fault that we studied in Borneo uh, with a PhD student some years ago. It formed in a sandstone, claystone package, and it probably just moved down very, very gently. There were no earthquakes. There were no sudden motions. Okay. So we have the normal faults. We have the reverse faults, the structured faults. We have seismic faults or aseismic faults, which slide gently. And then the third thing, which is very important to realize, that, that some faults are very, very big, and other faults can be very small. Of course, you have all seen the biggest faults on the planet, and those are the faults on plate boundaries. In this picture of a subduction zone, there is an enormous fault which goes down to very, very deep in the Earth mantle. This place here, this boundary between the two plates, is basically a fault, a very, very big fault. Of course, we know that it can move by seismic motion. It can generate enormous earthquakes. And these are thousands of kilometers long and go down 100, 150 kilometers in the Earth mantle. Enormous faults. Many faults are not as big as the one that I've just shown you. This is a beautiful fault from the area that uh, we are studying in Oman. Um, it shows a carbonate sequence which has moved about 150 meters. Okay, so this cliff is about 300 meters high, maybe 400 meters high, and you can clearly see the layering and the fault which has moved the left side down against the right side. So this is still quite a big fault. It's by far not as big as a subduction fault. And if you look somewhere else, this is in Greece, in one of the lignite mines in Greece, then the faults, uh, this whole outcrop is about 20 meters, they have an offset of maybe 25 centimeters or one meter. Okay, so this fault is again much smaller than the one before. Yet another example from Borneo. Here is my landscape for scale. And these faults here have an offset of maybe a centimeter or less. So these are again 20, 30 times as small as the one that I've just shown you before. So faults come in all kinds of sizes. Some of them are thousands of kilometers in size and some of them are just a centimeter in size. And if you have looked at all these pictures, then maybe one thing that really already has come to your mind is that it is very difficult to see how big a fault is if you don't have a scale bar. So the question I want to ask you now, here is a photograph that I've taken of faults, and, but I have not put a scale bar on it. And my question to you is, can you guess how big this is? And after you have thought about it, you probably will come to the conclusion that it is almost impossible to tell. If I don't give you a scale bar from the shape of these faults, you cannot tell how big the outcrop is. All the faults that I've shown you are actually very similar. And this property that the geometry is similar over different scales is called self-similarity. Self-similarity is a term that comes uh, from the mathematics of fractals. Maybe some of you have played around with a Mandelbrot fractal where you can zoom and zoom and you always see the same thing. This self-similarity can be measured in faults and the way you do that is you measure, for example, the length of a fault, or you measure the offset of a fault. And you do that for 
thousands of faults in an area. You measure all the faults and you write down how big they are. And if you do that, what you can do is you can make a histogram and plot the logarithm of the length of the fault or the logarithm of the throw of the fault, the offset of the fault, against the cumulative number. So on the <coughs> vertical axis, you plot how many of my total number of faults is larger than this throw. And what you see is that if in this particular area, the offset, the biggest offset is about 400 meters, then there are just a few, or 400 centimeters, I'm sorry, then there are just a few faults which have that offset. If you go to a smaller offset, say uh, 10 centimeters, you already have 10 times as many faults with the smaller offset. And if you go down to one centimeter, you again have about 10 times as many faults. So this diagram, which is shown here, tells you that there are a few faults with a large offset, and then if you go to smaller offset, you have more and more faults. And the increase in the number of faults is a straight line in a log-log diagram. Okay, this is logarithm and this is logarithm two. And this straight line here, the slope of this straight line is called the fractal dimension. The fractal dimension of this object, which consists of many faults, tells you basically how many more small faults you will find if you go to a smaller scale. And if you measure an object and it has this property, then it will be self-similar. It means that if you zoom in, you will see the same thing. And this self-similarity is not only shown by geometry, but for example also in earthquakes. This here is a map of, the area, of an area near New Madrid in the central United States, and this area is quite active seismically. Okay, so the dots here tell you or give you the location and also the magnitude of the earthquakes. If you take all the earthquake data and plot the magnitude of the earthquake against the number of earthquakes, you get a straight line which is very similar to the previous graph. The previous graph was about geometry and it is, this is about the energy which is released in the earthquake. And maybe you have already heard in the geophysics lecture that the magnitude of an earthquake is the logarithm of the energy which is released. So in some ways this is also a log-log graph and this number here, the famous B value, is a kind of a fractal dimension. Again, it shows you that there are a very few big earthquakes and if you go to smaller and smaller earthquake, you get more and more. It is a self-similar system. Now, what is a fault? A fault is an area of localized deformation. Let me write this down for you. deformation which is completely not localized is what we have learned. Let's say we take a circle and deform it into an ellipse using the D tensor that I talked about in my second lecture. Now, if you would take this circle and cut it in two and move it like this, then the deformation is localized in the area of the cut. This and this doesn't deform at all, and all the deformation is localized in this sharp zone. That is what I call localized deformation. And localized deformation is beautifully illustrated 